thanks for the organizers for having me he here and also for organizing the meeting. Yeah, so what George would have told us, of course, is about all this <laughs> underlying stuff. And uh, yeah, so I'm really also focusing in, in that talk, the, the second part, a lot on these J one half states. We're going to see we're going to put two holes. So the whole story is, of course, that the spin-orbit coupling mixes spin and orbital so that it makes more sense to talk in total angular momentum. And then one puts a hole, the hole is somewhere in the doublet, and that makes all this nice Kitai physics on the honeycomb lattice because on the honeycomb lattice one has the 90 degree bond angles which have this special structure of the couplings between the effective one half moments here which we often write as a spin because they really behave like one and the one thing that will also become important in the second part of my talk is that of course this happens in many lattice geometries which is nice and actually the square is really well understood and what is impressive there is how robust the J one half is there. One can even dope it a little bit, one can photo excite it and still one can mostly explain it with the J one half. Of course it is a different situation so if one does the right experiments then one will find differences to a pure J one half but really it's a very robust picture, one hole in these J one half systems. Now what I want to do is put two holes. And the easiest limit to understand is if spin orbit coupling is really huge, well then the two holes go into the J one half and this is then filled, or if the two holes you could also call it empty, and that is a band insulator. Uh, what would Hunzel coupling do? It would affect some excited states, so probably not be that interesting. This would be here. We have the J one half, if there are the two holes, that's a band insulator. If we make an excitation, that means putting one hole upstairs here. Hunzul coupling splits these levels a bit. But that's a bit unrealistic because one would need very large spin orbit coupling. And I'm more going to talk about the case where it's large and important, but not that large. So that instead we would rather think about LS coupling. So in that case, uh, one cannot draw a one particle picture like here. Instead, one has to first couple for the two particles the spin to a spin one and effective orbital angular momentum also for the two holes together is an, is an orbital angular momentum one. This would give nine degenerate states, three times three, and the spin orbit coupling acts to lift this ninefold degeneracy. So these would be the nine states here and spin orbit coupling lifts that. This is in some sense it's promising to be more interesting because the splitting here between, it's also a single ground state but the splitting here is not as large as it would be here. So one can hope to get more interesting physics. Uh, yeah, that was Guignard in, in that paper wrote about that. So he based the story on this scenario here, that we have that single ground state, but the excited triplets are not terribly high in energy. So that super exchange can compete with spin orbit coupling and it would then induce triplons, it can make them move and it could drive magnetic phases and hopefully interesting ones. And this triplet is like three flavors of hardcore bosons. It's a bit, this effective physics is then a bit like the uh, stories that we know about singlet dimers where two sides are very strongly coupled into a singlet and the, the dimers next to each other, they talk a bit and that induces the, or this makes the triplet excitations on each dimer mobile and, and interesting, it's a bit similar but also a bit different because in our case the, dial, uh, the dimer is on the same side and driven to by spin orbit coupling. So the two things I want to talk about is why would we want this? This is going to be the first part of my talk where I would talk about a story that we found in such a system that was nice. Uh, these triplet excitations on the honeycomb lattice, they tend to become topologically non-trivial very easily. And the second part of the talk is where might this be relevant? This is where I'm going to come back to the square lattice because there is a compound that is better understood where we can make more uh, thorough calculations. Yeah, so first the question, uh, if we had that physics, what could we get? Um, we have, this is the story with the singlet, uh, would be the ground state, this lambda here suppresses triplons. So that is the density of triplons, and if lambda is large, then there are no triplons. Uh, the super exchange are all these parameters. It can induce triplons on neighboring sites, or it can make them move once they're there. Now there are lots of constants. 
these Cs here are all approximately one, and also we checked numerically if you take them a little bit different, it doesn't really matter. So let's keep those to one. Um, that here is, as usual, complicated. If we had only exchange via oxygen, then we would expect a certain... And if Hunsrud coupling is important enough to justify that picture, but not so strong to strongly modify these constants, then we would expect this limit here, a certain combination of J and K. If we had only direct hopping, we would be relatively close to a Kitaev-like symmetry, so only K or strong K. And if both are active, well, then we also have gamma. And additionally, the role of Hunsrud coupling is not that easy because it's certainly present, it justifies the whole scenario, and it also affects the couplings. So what we do is actually we use those as adjustable parameters because it's, without having a material in mind, it would be really hard to say what they should be. And uh, yeah, that one scenario that Guignard proposed where this was this limit here where then each triplon can only move on a path. So the first thing is we check the classical phase diagram. So what does the center here mean? The center here means very strong spin orbit coupling. There are no triplons. This is not a paramagnet. It's the singlet dominates. Outside means super exchange is strong. So we have a triplon on every side and because that's unfavorable and they are going to kind of order. And we can map that to an effective classical model. And then we did first step classical Monte Carlo and the results are boring because they're exactly what one would get for the classical Kitaev Heisenberg antiferromagnet. That's not obvious because the classical model would have extra features built in, but they just turn out not to be important. The only difference is we have here this non-magnetic regime in the middle. The next step is we looked at the quantum version. Because after all, I mean, fine, the classical model turns out to be equivalent, but the underlying quantum degree of freedom is different. And we decided that after all, we liked rectangular phase diagrams better. So here, the x-axis is an alpha that parameterizes Kitaev versus Heisenberg coupling. In this parameter, the gamma is switched off. And the y-axis is the strength. So here on the bottom would be the robust paramagnet supported by spin-orbit coupling. And up there would be ordered phases. Up there, it goes fairly closely towards the classical limit. It's slightly more classical than the J1 half version, but otherwise still very similar. Uh, there's one, and, and so here, this is a first order phase transition, one of the classical ones. But here, the other one, there's something in between. This is again similar to the Kitaev Heisenberg model, where here would be Kitaev spin liquid. In our case, it's not a spin liquid, it's what we call a triplon liquid. So there are definitely triplons there, but they don't order. So is that a 24% calculation, is it Well, so, ah, yeah, okay. If we really do the full, full model with gammas and everything, then not. No, not to exactly. Them. If we, well, for example, if we can specialize on this one, then we can throw stuff out and then we can go to that size, yes. And so we investigated this triplon liquid in more detail, and here then we were able to do larger sizes, and also Yeji and Ginyad have since done analytical work that supports the conclusion that indeed there's a liquid. Unfortunately, it's probably, a, well, it's almost certainly it doesn't have any topological degeneracy, but it's still kind of nice. But what I find striking here is really very similar to the J1 half Kitaev Heisenberg limit, except that the liquid is a different liquid. So then, next thing is we have this non-magnetic regime, and so, now... Sorry, when mm -hmm. you say the liquid is a different liquid, so with which of correlation functions yeah, so, of, of yeah, so the first thing we tried, of course, is any magnetic or bond order where we can't say much on, on the lattice. And then we had a guess for what happened. So we would know one can here make also a classical limit. And in that classical limit, one would have a huge ground state degeneracy. And then one gets some quantum order by disorder effect that selects something out of there. And we just didn't find any order, and, and Yiji, who thought about that a lot, didn't find any either. And we have a bit of a guess for the wave function. So that is the ordered states, which, as I said, is similar to the Kitaev Heisenberg model that we know for the spin one half. Now, for the excitations here down there, where there's not, no magnetic order. So we say this is large, we don't have many triplons. <coughs> 
And in that limit, we can leave out those terms because they create two triplons that's really expensive in energy here. Uh, that is really important when we go to the ordered phases, but we don't go there. So here we can leave that out. And then this looks like a band structure. So triplon is created maybe by a passing neutron or whatever, and then it can hop. These bands are here topologically trivial. Non-trivial triplons are known from the bilayer, uh, uh, from the interside dimers that I mentioned, and there they rely on cherubinsky moria interaction. Here, we also find non-trivial bands, but when we have a magnetic field. I discuss here the case for only kitaev like coupling because it's easiest to discuss. In that case, if we had only that, then each triplon would sit on a bond and couldn't move. Now the magnetic field allows it to change its flavor, and then it can move, and at the same time it gets a finite churn number. This is because of this I here in front. So that would be the bands. Red would be without magnetic field, everything degenerate and flat. With the magnetic field, some splitting and also churn numbers. And there are edge states. So there are actually two kinds. This is the states on the cylinder, and there are the states here where the spin-orbit coupling would be. They can also be considered topological of a kind, but and the topological thing is that they have to cross here the lambda line at some point, uh, but they would not cross the gap. And here are the other edge states, the ones that are due to the churn numbers, they would cross a gap, and they're both on that system. Now that was a special point in the phase diagram. Now we did that for many coupling parameters, and that is what I found striking, that the bands are topologically non topologically non-trivial basically everywhere. Uh, that is a complicated figure. The y-axis is the magnetic field, the x-axis parameterizes the relative size in J and K, and the numbers are churn numbers, and the only thing I want to get across here is that there's color everywhere because we put color wherever bands are topologically non-trivial, and that happens really almost everywhere except for the pure uh, Heisenberg limit. Now, the gaps between the bands might be small, which might mean that this is not experimentally relevant to topological character, but it's present everywhere and robust and nicely separated by nice gaps in many regimes. Yeah, so that was a bit why I think that this uh, J0, J1 physics might be interesting, or one reason. Uh, the next is, is that relevant anywhere? If not on a compound that does this, then at least somewhere else uh, as a first, first step. Now, the type of physics was discussed quite a bit for uh, double perovskite iridates. The problem there turned out it's probably valid, but it's a bit too robust because they are, they are just in their singlet ground state and don't do much. The iridiums have a very strong spin orbit cupping. They're fairly large apart, so super exchange is small, and then the singlet wins. So, yeah, fine, it's not so interesting. And then there is the calcium ruthenate, which is a bit more controversial. So it's antiferromagnetically ordered. So we know that if it's applicable, then at least something happens. Um, the excitations can be well explained, assuming we have this excitonic scenario. And this is this maximum at the gamma point that is really naturally comes out here. And nobody would doubt that this is due to spin orbit coupling. That is fairly uncontroversial. But the alternative view would be, yeah, that may be, but just thinking in terms of spins and adding spin orbit coupling as a correction is quite reasonable too. And that the argument here goes if we use, for example, an Apinicia treatment that very well agrees with ARPAS, then we would find that the XY orbital is basically filled. So that is why I draw it here. And then the spin, the two holes are in the two other orbitals and they form a spin and they order and find spin orbit coupling exists, of course, and modifies the excitations. And yeah, so typical messy story. I think everybody would agree it's somewhere in between and we wanted to, wanted to understand that. So how it's best to think about that, which is why we did model studies, because first we needed to identify the limits to see what we could expect to see. So we did very initial cluster approach applied to models for electrons. And we calculated magnetic spectra for a super exchange model. So there are spins and orbitals. And then we also got parameters for calcium ruthenate and plugged them into the model to see where it falls. I'm going to come back to that later. So, and what is the question? The question is, we have here this L equals one, S equals one. If there was nothing else, it would stabilize a complex pattern like that. 
Now, of course, if we were actually interested in that case, we would probably also have to think about the lattice, but we are not. We are more interested in this part here. Here would be the limit with the large crystal field. Here we would say xy is doubly occupied. The two holes go in the other two orbitals, form a spin. Here would be the excitonic limit. We would say, OK, um, spin orbit coupling prefers this state. Super exchange wants to mix in that. As a compromise on each side, it has a wave function that mixes all three orbitals. This is why I used lots of colors, but has a little magnetic moment that can order. And I think everybody would agree that we are somewhere in, in between, but we want to know where and whether it's better to use this description or that. <coughs> and I can give away the conclusion is that actually these two pictures of, of orbital polarization and oxidonic magnetism coexist surprisingly peacefully. Yeah, so that electronic model is the hopping for the T to G orbitals. Here I show the nearest neighbor hopping. We also had next nearest neighbors in a later stage, but let's start with the simple model. A crystal field that favors, uh, so that wants the electrons to be in the XY orbital and a spin orbit coupling and uh, well, on site interactions. We keep those fairly large. In this talk, they are not going to be varied, and, and the rest, yes. Variational cluster approximation, what do we do? We get the free energy and the, and the one particle Green's function of a small cluster, two by two sites in our case. And then we get the self energy out of the Green's function, put that in the Green's function of a big system, thermodynamic limit ideally. And then we get the optimal cluster energy. We can optimize symmetry breaking. So the idea is if the fully symmetric Hamiltonian of the th thermodynamic limit prefers a symmetry broken self energy, then probably it likes to break symmetry. So we can do things like that, where that lambda could be spin or orbital angular momentum or some density. And an ordering vector that needs to fit on the cluster. And that, of course, is a strong restriction. And then one calculates grant potentials. This is what we would get for the model without a crystal field splitting. The reddish-orange thing is a stripey order that happens at small spin orbit coupling. The bluish things is a checkerboard pattern that happens at intermediate spin orbit coupling. And the gray is when spin orbit coupling wins and makes a paramagnet, then we don't see any symmetry breaking, of course. <coughs> and yeah, what we found here is that it's really, it's really only the symmetry that is important, but not exactly how we break the symmetry. So now uh, more details on, on this phase is what we found. This is without crystal field splitting, and we look at that model because we want to understand how we would see excitonic magnetism in that method. And for small spin orbit coupling, we see that the orbitals become quite differently occupied. This is because it's this stripe order where one orbital is always empty and the other two kind of alternate. That's here. And the orange means it's a stripey magnetic order. Then comes when spin orbit coupling is strong enough. Uh, it kills this order. Instead, it makes a checkerboard pattern, pattern here. Uh, the light blue and the dark blue means which combination of spin and orbital angular momentum exactly optimize the grand potential. So this was here, but they're all pretty similar. So this is not a big, this is not a phase transition. I mean, this is just rather a detail for this system. And here we also see that the singlet ground state suddenly becomes really important. Here they're all about the same, but now suddenly it's really important. And it, of course, dominates the paramagnet. <coughs> the other nice thing that we see here uh, when we, yeah, this is the excitonic thing. When we go from the paramagnetic self energy, it's the light gray symbols, to the antiferromagnetic one, that's the black ones, then the J0, the singlet, loses weight, and the triplets, they gain weight. This is exactly what we expect for the excitonic magnetism. It comes about because the triplet excitations are mixed into the ground state. So this is how it happens. And of course, in the gray, the singlet just wins and stays there. Yeah, that was. And, and yeah, all the time, once we have, once we've gone to checkerboard order, the higher orbital angular momentum states are irrelevant. They're down here, they are hardly used. One excursion towards the JJ limit, then we would have to make spin orbit coupling much, much larger. And then this, this is the singlet state that I showed before that dominates the paramagnet up here. And if one makes spin orbit coupling even larger, its weight goes a bit down because another singlet takes over. And this is the singlet that comes from JJ coupling, so the doubly occupied J1 half bands. Uh, the red curves are the ones that were 
were obtained with, uh, without Hund's rule coupling, so uncorrelated correl uh, calculations. And yes, the JJ story is a, would be a band insulator and uncorrelated. One also would see that in the bands. So this is the band insulator in the JJ limit. But we stick to this. So here to LS coupling, where Hund's rule coupling is important. So the next question is what happens if we have a crystal field? Because the crystal field can, would, would want something different. Uh, and we're certainly somewhere in between. Uh, so is it better to say it's a spin one with some spin orbit coupling, or is it better to say it's an excitonic insulator with some crystal field correction? And to do that, we first have to see what the crystal field does to the picture that we have formed of the excitonic antiferromagnet. This is here is the spin orbit coupling on the x-axis and we have orbital occupation numbers without spin orbit coupling. The blue regime is the pure antiferromagnet, uh, spin antiferromagnet without spin orbit coupling. And here the xy orbital is, doesn't contain any holes. So this is hole density here. And this is a clear spin and the, the two holes are in the other two orbitals. If we switch on spin orbit coupling, then yes, the, x, the orbital occupations get a bit more equal. But still, the system clearly remains very orbitally polarized. I mean, say, for example, here we have 20% hole in XY and 90% hole in each of the other two. So it's still clearly polarized. On the other hand, we also see that spin orbit cap coupling has an effect because here it has switched off the antiferromagnetic order. So here the paramagnet has won, which is a clear difference from the pure spin system. And um, orbital occupations have become more equal here, but they're still also clearly different. So we see already here that the excitonic picture and orbital polarization can coexist. Then we look at the other. So this was hole densities in the orbitals. This is projections onto the idealized states for the spin orbit coupling that we had before. And the first observation is the J equal two states are not irrelevant now. They are actually have a quite substantial weight. But what is the same as before is that spin orbit coupling pushes weight into the singlet. And what is actually also the same as before is that when we compare the paramagnetic curve, the gray one, to the, ferromag uh, to the antiferromagnetic one, the black one, then weight leaves the singlet and goes into the triplet state. The quintuplet states, the J equal two on the other hand, they are present, they make the orbital polarization, but they don't participate in the magne magnetism. So here we start to understand that orbital polarization can coexist with the excitonic mechanism because the difference between non-magnetic and magnetic really only affects the J0 and the J1 states as in the excitonic one. And these are in that sense more a background here. So what we could also do is instead of looking at the eigenstates of, of spin orbit coupling, we could look at these levels here so that interpolate between spin orbit coupling and crystal field. And that is done here. And then we indeed see that we only have these states involved here, the lowest singlet and then the doublet. And excitonic magnetic ordering is seen where weight is shifted from the singlet from the, in, in the gray non-magnetic curve to the magnetic one with black. What is the red and orange points? I'm going to come to them next. Next they are our best guess at where calcium ruthenite might lie. So we got that from Vanier downfolding for these bands here. And then in the VCA calculation, we kept the biggest hoppings. So which is the nearest neighbor hopping, which is different for XY and for the other two. A next nearest neighbor hopping for XY, and then also a, a hopping that uh, is due to the orthorhombic distortion and mixes orbitals. We tried it without that and with that, and we know what it does. And when we run the calculation with these couplings plus with the other parameters that we inferred from experiment, then we get the orange point for the paramagnetic phase and the red points for the antiferromagnetic ones. And we see it fits here. It would be fairly orbitally polarized. This agrees with other calculations. So with only 20% hole in XY and the rest in the other two. Here we would say, well, yeah, that's a spin one. On the other hand, the magnetic transition is nicely in the excitonic picture. And one would also see that in the various experiments. So this is ARPIS would be 
On the right-hand side, without spin-orbit coupling. In the middle, the antiferromagnet with spin-orbit coupling. On the left-hand side, uh, with spin-orbit coupling, but non-magnetic. And there are certainly differences that are due to spin-orbit coupling between right and middle. But with the resolution in ARPUS, not so sure they would show up. So here we would definitely say, well, spin-orbit coupling might be there, but it might not be terribly important. Yeah. Magnetic, magnetic degrees of freedom, we expect already something different because we have seen in the magnet, magnetic phase transition that only the singlet, triplet states are involved. We can't do magnetic excitation spectra with the VCA, unfortunately. So we got the second order super exchange model, which looks ugly. It has Heisenberg terms that would be dominant if we have an orbitally polarized regime, but it also have, or has orbital flip terms, so where the orbital occupation changes on the bonds. And, of course, we include the on-site part, spin orbit coupling, and the crystal field. And then we get the spectra. These are the spectra that we got with the ab initio parameters, except for that hopping that mixes orbitals. We left that out, admittedly, mostly for technical reasons. It would be a pain to include. And the spectra that we get as we <sighs> fairly nicely with experimental ones, considering we have zero fit parameters. So we have that maximum here at about 50 order of magnitude milli electron volt and at the gamma point. And the rest doesn't look unreasonable either. So this was a nice, yeah? And then we, well, we also broke the symmetry, but what I want to talk about is this maximum is sensitive to the whole occupation in the xy orbital. So if we make crystal field stronger so that the spin picture becomes better, then automatically this goes down. And then also this is no longer a maximum like here, but a local minimum. So that's very sensitive to having something in xy. 20% or 25% is enough, but something needs to be there. Yeah, that were the people who were involved. Friedemann and Therese, uh, Friedemann and, and Pavel in the first part, the triplon, triplons, and Teresa and Michi in the second part, so the model studies and, and the calcium ruthenate. And as a summary, well, I first talked about this nice colorful thing where we have non-trivial bands everywhere. The second part was on the calcium ruthenate, where when we look at orbital occupations, we would say that's a spin one system but we have understood why the magnetic excitation spectra are so much more easily understood with the excitonic system. That is because when we go from the paramagnet to the antiferromagnet, really only these states uh, work together and it works exactly with the excitonic mechanism with the weight, weight shift from a singlet on-site ground state to a doublet of on-site slightly excited states that can, however, mix with the super exchange. And we have nicely modeled the magnetic excitations without any fit parameter, which tells us that our modeling for the calcium ruthenate is probably quite good. Yeah. <laughs>